It is time once again for the Scramble Podcast alongside my podcast partner, Chris Flynn, who is a member of the Canadian Football Hall of Fame and a three-time Heck Crichton Award winner. We are joined this week by TSN's James Duffy. James from Toronto, uh, tuning in from Toronto. Thanks for joining us. Really good to see you again. Good to see you, my friend. Uh, Quick story for your listeners, because you're too modest to say, when I arrived in Halifax for the World Juniors, I'm still my world favorite World Juniors ever, by the way, uh, Paul had left uh, uh, a beautiful uh, bottle of uh, it's Halifax's finest, which I sampled quite often, was waiting for me in my room. So uh, uh, thank nice. you, my brother. Thank you for making that, me. That is awesome. I was insistent on some maritime hospitality. Look, TSN has been very good to me, as you know, James, continues to be good to me. Uh, one of the funnier byproducts of that World Juniors was – after the semifinal game, you're in Halifax and you throw to Sports Center, and I flew to Toronto for the weekend to anchor Sports Center. So it was James is in my home building doing the World Juniors, throwing to Hollingsworth, who's in a Toronto sports studio. It was just uh, it was a funny flip flop, but uh, that was a pretty. Actually, before we get into this further, James, uh, let's revisit this for a moment. That was an epically successful World Junior tournament. The vibe, the attendance, the outcome, the star-studded talent. It seemed to, from my perspective, check all the right boxes. Yeah, and it was so badly needed. And I, I mean, I think part of it was, look, Halifax did an amazing job, perfect place to have a World Juniors. Uh, the fans were so into it, so deserved that it was there. And it comes off of the heels of COVID and the disasters that we had in Edmonton. No offense to the folks in Edmonton. They just got bad luck, right? Where we did the, the one World Juniors in the bubble. And then the one uh, got canceled and then the one in the summer where nobody really cared about because it's the summer. And so it, it was just so great to have what I would call a real Canadian World Juniors again. And it was also great to get in a smaller rink. I've been arguing for years that, you know, th this tournament got so big and Hockey Canada was stuck going in these big rinks to make money. And I get it. But uh, it, it's, it's really nice. It was really nice to get back in a compact sort of 10,000 seat uh thing where you can blow the roof off and they did it was awesome that building was wobbling uh when they scored that overtime goal it was great and chris uh, chris chris knows a lot about halifax crowds as well um it's just there's a little bit of a cliche that halifax is an event town there's all kinds of buzz about will we have a cfl team someday those sort of things but when it comes to those short compressed events that come in in this small medium-sized venue it seems to work really well. So I was thrilled as a Haligonian that it went so well. And I know the network was thrilled as well as were hockey fans. Now, Chris, before we get going here, uh, we want to touch on James's career and touch on some hockey themes. But Chris is all about football. So he wanted to rope you in some football questions here. So Chris, have at it. Uh, questions and answers to James and things you want to touch on with him. Well, I'm big on hockey too in all sports. But I, know, I, yeah. I just know that, uh, yeah, I just know James and I have a few uh, – a few uh, teammates or guys that we played football with or against and touch football. Another guy was my buddy, Matt Nealon, my old star receiver. He said he played, he played for that big team in Ottawa with Rod Moores. They won the Ottawa and the P and Canadians. They won like, I think five uh -huh. nationals in a row. He said he played, he thinks he might've played with you a few times, but he definitely remembers playing against you. So yeah. Uh, remember, yeah, Matt Nealon. Well, look, I'll go back even further. Uh, and, and, Paul, so when I'm when I'm going, Chris and I were going to high school at the same time, and uh, he was already a legend there. We never ended up playing because uh, you played in the league over on the other side, right? Yeah, or, we, or, pl we we what? played in Quebec at Filmer Wright and Hall, but we were allowed to play in the Ottawa League one year in '84. Right. So '84 uh, '85 is when I played, and we we I played at Gloucester High and. Uh, that's when you guys won it all, I think, right? Uh, yeah, say 84, yeah. So, so I'm, you know, I'm a high school football player, and this guy is already, like, a legend for what he's doing. Oh, and, you know, back th those days, Holly, there's no TV. You know, there's not, you know, I think Chris might have made it on, like, the, the CJOH local news or something a couple of times, or might have been Athlete of the Week or something like that. But it was all, like, just these rumors, right, about this guy at this high school that was, like, just completely lighting it up. And uh, that was our goal was to somehow make it to the city final to play Philemon Wright, and we got knocked out somewhere along the way. And then uh, 
yeah, we had a lot of connections through touch football and I ended up playing, I think you, you threw for, for me in, in one tournament maybe uh, in the end, but we had tons of buddies and uh, touch football was, I kind of hide this Paul because, you know, I'm the hockey host in Canada, even though I do a bunch of other sports, but touch football was my, like well, the only sport I was decent at and the, the thing I played forever and ever and ever. And it was my absolute passion. And I know Chris was the same. Like I would play a hundred games a year on like four teams back in our, in our twenties. And uh, I just, some of the greatest times, times of my life going to tournaments, uh, you know, across Ontario all the time, there, there was just nothing better. And all the buddy, all the, the Ray Ferraros and uh, Jeff O'Neill's always bugged me about touch football. Right. <laughs> but it but was- in Ottawa, it was big. And of course, Ed Laverty, who was oh, yeah. like, he was the king of, of the football organizing and everything like that. And you mentioned Dave LaMarche. He was like that too. Dave, Dave is, I think, 59 or 60. He's a few years older than us. He still plays. He played for my Falcons team last fall in Buckingham. And he was a guy that played it year round as well. And so I know you mentioned his name earlier too. So yeah, uh, two of my greatest tragedies in sport. We lost a, uh, an Ontario final at Lansdowne Park now, TD Place or whatever, on a on a 55-yard Hail Mary uh, on the last play of the game. I'd already opened a beer on the sideline and was celebrating. And then we lost a national semifinal to a team from Edmonton. Uh, we blew like a 20-point lead and somehow lost. And I, I still lie awake uh, in bed at night because I have a pathetic life thinking about those two. <laughs> uh, James, uh, I always say, um, and I'm very open about this, I was always athletic, but I was never the athlete I wanted to be. So I became a sportscaster. Is that similar to your story? I think that's most of us. Um, I was completely delusional. Back of those times when I was talking about, like, I uh, I was obsessed with Cle- the University of Clemson. And I think because the cheerleaders had those little orange paws on their face and I was best. And so I was, you know, grade 12, 13 at Gloucester High School. I was a 5'10" one hundred and fifty pound cornerback and I truly believe that I was gonna get a scholarship to Clemson uh and play for 49ers. <laughs> just did, was, it just didn't work out. Uh, I ended up getting <laughs> by McGill. McGill was the only school that really wanted me and I was gonna go to McGill and uh and play football and I sort of ended up having a come to Jesus moment at the last second and saying, well I was gonna take phys ed at McGill and be a gym teacher and I sort of changed my mind at the last second and decided uh, as Paul said, that maybe I wasn't good enough athletically to do anything. And so I went to Carleton to take journalism. But my my fellow cornerback, I played left corner and this other guy played right corner. And he went to McGill and uh, they won the the uh, the yes, national. They, they beat us. They beat us in 87 in the, so the national semifinals. <laughs> when they won, because that was the team I was supposed to be on. But yeah, Paul, I was definitely a failed athlete. And I think if you went through. Uh, sportscasters, uh, male and female. I think a lot of us are were wannabes that couldn't make it, and this was the next best option. Yeah, I was left to memorizing the backs of baseball cards. That became my skill <laughs> later in life, which, by the way, was a transferable skill set in their career. Uh, let's go down your career path a little bit, James. I recall you, so in my early years at ATV, which is now CTV Atlantic, you were in Ottawa, CGOH, correct? Correct. Yeah, so I... When, when the great thing about Carlton's journalism program, you had to do a couple of uh, internships and CJOH, which became CTV Ottawa, had a really great relationship with Carlton and you could do a one week internship there and they actually let you do reports on the air. So I went there and did it. And, uh, you know, timing is everything in our business. And one of the reporters there, Chris will probably remember the name, Guy Lepage, Guy Lepage, CJOH News, get you know, uh, Guy Lepage, broke his ribs skiing on the Saturday after I had completed my internship on the Friday. And I think they were desperate for someone to fill his shift. And I was fresh in their minds and they called me and uh, basically I never stopped working there and ended up working there for seven or eight years before I went out to BC before I got hired by TSN. So yeah, just right place, right time. But I was a news reporter who covered fires and murders and politics and all those things, always wanting to do sports, but you know, TSN wasn't around or was just in its infancy. And there weren't a lot of sports jobs back then, as you know, right? There was like the one or two guys at every station and that was it. And you, you may, feel free to disagree or, or agree with me, but 
to this day, I do some news reporting and it makes me a better sports journalist. I, I like to keep close to the news reporting side of it. It really helps me foundationally in my sports journalism. I don't think I would be <clears throat> where I am if I hadn't spent those years in news. And the time when I do speak to broadcasting or ju journalism students who want to do sports, I always say, don't be afraid to do news because I don't want to get bored people with the inside baseball, but you know, it teaches you how to be a, uh, a better writer. It teaches yeah. you how um, you know, to be a better reporter, it's a lot harder covering news than it is covering sports, I think. And so, yeah, I think I owe any success that I've had uh, to to all those years in news. The coolest thing about it I, is you did something different every single day, right? You came in as a reporter and your job was, you know, like I said, so one day it was a murder and then one day it was some political thing. And your job was to learn as much as you possibly could about that one subject in one day. And I love that part of it, but I still wanted to do sports more. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Now, I remember I want to bring Kristen to this next part because it touches on your play by play years. Uh, you and I, we never hosted Sports Center together, but I would do the Sports Center updates when you were doing the NHL panel and the CFL panel. But you did some play by play. St. Mary's won the 1999 Final Eight Basketball Championship. Every Husky has its day. St. Mary's, this is yours. Every, that was your call. Hey, well, don't butcher that, Paul. Every sorry, time. sorry. You want to hear something funny? So two quick stories on that. Sure. Um, first of all, uh, I was telling this to Kenzie Lalonde at the World Juniors, who, you know, does a fine job doing international hockey for us. And Kenzie had put in her reps out east, you know, doing hundreds of games, college and high school. And this is a true story. My very first play-by-play -play gig at any level. OK, high school, local cable TV, whatever. My very first play by play job was an NBA game. Uh, I had never done play by play in my career. I mean, I'd done it. I practiced myself on the home in my underwear, but I'd never gotten a chance to do it. And because I spent all those years as a news reporter and when I started at TSN, I was I was hosting football and basketball and I got to do a, a Raptors game in Atlanta. And that was the first time I'd ever done play by play. But shortly thereafter, I got to come to Halifax and do the CIS finals and it was St. Mary's who won their first title for a long time. And I always, rem I remembered sitting in my room the night before, I think they were playing university of Alberta in the final, if I'm correct. And I was trying to think of what would be my lines. All a lot of play by play guys say they don't think of them. I think most people do. What are you going to say if this team wins the championship? And so with the Huskies, I, I came up with this line that every dog has its day. Huskies. This one is yours. So awesome. I did out of it. But, uh, and then about 10 years later, I was in a bar somewhere. And this guy comes running across the room and says, every every dog has his day. He was on the team. Turns out he's a producer at Sportsnet, Paul Bromby. But uh, yes, he was I know. I <laughs> that line. But then the other thing, when the uh, who, UConn won this year, right? The uh, NCAAs. Yeah. And. The guy, the play-by-play -play guy for UConn used the exact same line, so I was going to sue him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you never, you uh, Chris was asking me today on the phone, did you do any football play-by-play -play? You just or just football studio? If you'd asked young me what my, what my dream was back then, it would have been to do football play-by-play. -play. And I loved, I was one of those guys that just loved all football. I loved the NFL. I loved the CFL. Uh, I love, love watching Chris Flynn on television. I would watch in Ottawa. Chris might remember this on the French channel. You got this show called Les Zero du Samedi, which they would show like seven-year-olds playing football on the Quebec uh, local station. And I would watch that. I would watch any football you could find. And uh, somewhere I hosted CFL for my first three years at TSN. And then they, let, they started to let me do play-by-play. -play, and I thought that was going to be my future. And I did about 10 games, maybe 10, 12 games. And I, I don't pretend to know if I was any good. I don't think I necessarily had the lungs, you know, of a, of a Chris Cuthbert or, you know, the call of a Gord Miller or someone like that or a Rod Smith even. But um, I really liked it. And that was what I wanted to do with my career. And right basically at the end of that summer is when the hockey job came up. And you pretty much can't turn down hosting hockey in this country and I love hockey too football and hockey have sort of always been one and one a to me so I took the hockey job and that was kind of it for my football play-by-play -play life which I sometimes think about sometimes I think 
maybe uh, when they get sick of seeing me on the panel that maybe I'll try to go back and uh, that'll what I'll do in my older years. But, uh, but I don't know, maybe that ship has sailed. Well, I, and uh, I always chuckle. Like I've done play by play a few times and I don't pretend to be good at it, but the first time I did it was at the CIS final eight and our friend in common, John Hines, Hines, was the producer. Um, James, I had no idea of the process. So I have my headset on and he's, feeding the stats and the plays and the rhythm of the game in my ear. And I'm mimicking what he's saying. So I thought all these years of play-by-play guys were pulling all these little fantastic little facts out of thin air. And it was all being fed into my earpiece. It's like, wow, I'm sounding pretty smart. This is pretty good. (laughs) But that's the, that's the part that people at home don't get to see. No. And then Heinze worked with me. And I think both those early games that, that first NBA game I did and, I believe that first CIS game, and he's one of the best and remains one of the best uh, producers out there. So I was, I was very lucky to have him. Yeah. And Chris, uh, if you knew John yeah. Hines, you'd be impressed because oh. for John Hines, if you don't know the third string center for the Notre Dame fighting Irish, he thinks you don't know anything about sports. He's his level of knowledge is unbelievable. Go ahead, yeah. Chris. You want to say something? Yeah. But, yeah. James, I just want to ask you a lot of people like your, your sense of humor that you kind of, have and show you know when you're on the show when you joke around with the other guys and guys that know me know i like to joke around i like that will ferrell kind of <clears throat> silly humor like stepbrothers kind of thing and i know that's the kind of humor that you like and i've i've seen a few of the videos that you've you've done including the yeah the uh the parody for hangover and i was just wondering which was really good by the way i was just wondering how did you guys you or your buddies or how did you guys come up with that idea for that for that parody which was done so well which included some of the LA Kings including, right. including the coach <laughs> <laughs> well thank you for saying that uh one of one of the things I'm proudest of and I guess most fond of at TSN is they've they've let us do these stupid things over the years and it's one of my favorite parts of the gig um and you know it's it's, it's funny when people ask me like my broadcasting icons growing up and obviously there's some guys in sports that i watched i always liked jim nance and bob costas back in the day and i watched dave hodge growing up but i my answer is usually david letterman because i i was a huge david letterman fan from the beginning when he when he had a noon show it started at nbc and then he had the late night show at nbc that i would stay up and watch in my teenage years and my 20s and i think that influenced me, me probably too. more than any sports broadcaster and because I think Dave was kind of the one who really started sarcastic, stupid humor and was at the forefront of that. And, you know, the guy throwing watermelons off a building for humor. And so I think I probably stole things from him. Don't pretend that I was anywhere close to as funny as him. But uh, the hangover thing, funny enough, it, it purely came out of we had a member of our staff, one of our editors, the late Rick, Rick Hodgson, who unfortunately passed away at way too young an age a few years ago. And Rick looked like Zach Galifianakis, uh, like exactly like Zach Galifianakis. And so somebody said to me one day, uh, I, you know, I'd done a few of these parodies before and they said, you guys should do something on, on the hangover. I think it was Billy Dotson, our producer and, and use, uh, and use Rick. And that's all, that's all he told me. And we came up with this idea of the Kings had just won the Stanley cup and Stanley cup hangovers. And uh, I came up with this whole idea, but we had to, we had like 24 hours to go to LA and, and shoot it. And the idea was basically a hangover parody where uh, Aaron Ward used to be on the panel and we lose Aaron Ward in LA when we're trying to cover the game and we're trying to find him. And, Somebody, so I came up the same thing as the hangover. Somebody had drugged our drinks, and we had this crazy night. And but I couldn't figure out who drugged our drinks, and that was really holding up the whole idea. And finally, I said Daryl Sutter was coaching. Then I said, if I could get Daryl Sutter to uh, be the guy who spiked the drinks, it would be hilarious. But I said Daryl will never do it. So on a whim, I sent an email to the Kings PR guy and said, Hey, we've, we're thinking about doing this hangover parody. We want to fly to L. And this was like five days before we were supposed to fly to LA and we still didn't have anything for it. And, and he got back to me and said, yeah, Daryl's going to do it. And I, I couldn't believe it. I, I just couldn't believe he was going to do it. And it made the piece for me. And it was complete guerrilla filmmaking. Like we really had, we had nothing. And we had literally 24 hours from the time we landed to the time we left. And I had this script figured out. Darren Drager came down with me and, uh, I had the Mike Tyson tattoo on my face. 
And that, it was that was uh, awesome. You had Alj Kopitar. You had a couple of Pender. You had a couple. Yeah, of, we went to a, yeah. the Kings were playing that night, and we like Mary Hart was there, and we did something with her, and Matthew Perry was there, and we did yes. a bit with. And uh, the whole thing was it was it was nuts, but I I think I have more fun on those than anything else because you're just running around trying to come up with ideas, and uh, it was it was a blast. The, the funniest thing of the postscript on that was we finally got finished shooting and went out for a nice dinner in Manhattan Beach at a, quite a fancy restaurant, and all these people were staring at me. It was all these old couples, and I didn't realize why they were staring at me. And I went to the bathroom, and I forgot the tattoo was still on, so I had the Mike Tyson. <laughs> Face tattoo. <laughs> oh, it, it was uh, it was a pretty cool video, and and all the guys you had involved in it too. So it was. Uh, I well, saw a few I, others that you did too. It were, were, was <laughs> pretty funny. I enjoyed the uh, the hangover part because, um, and Chris, just to give you some like inside TSN baseball on our NHL email. If um, somebody sends an email out and says we're hearing player X has signed a three year contract. Darren Dreger will reply all and say confirmed. And so uh, here he is. There's Darren Dreger hammered, confirmed. And I was like, it's like, I don't know if anyone at home gets that, but I find that freaking funny. <laughs> Eagles. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Dreg still bugs me about that because I, I had to convince him to go, right? He's got a busy schedule. And I said, look, you know, we'll, we'll shoot for two hours and then you can have a, a day off and a night off in LA. We'll go for a nice dinner. And we literally shot for like 20 hours straight. And so he hasn't forget that, but I think, I think it was worth it. Well, listen, let's, uh, let's pivot to some of the hockey happening today. First of all, um, Edmonton Oilers play later tonight. Um, interesting player in goal for Vegas, which makes it uh, in my mind's eye, the possibility that Edmonton could fill the net. Uh, but at the same time, Edmonton has let me down the past couple of years you tell me if I'm wrong. It feels like Edmonton is a team that could and should get out of the West this year. What do you think? I picked them to win the Stanley Cup. And uh, when we were doing that preview show, I, I had Edmonton and Boston in the final. And at first I picked Boston. And then I said to myself, if McDavid gets to a Stanley Cup final, how are you going to stop him if he gets that close to a Stanley Cup? And so I changed it to Edmonton. And obviously I was dead wrong, like so many people were about Boston. But yeah, I just, I just think this year, uh, and let, let's first put the big asterisk besides this. The, the first round showed us that I, I just think it, it's so nuts that every series is is basically, if not fifty fifty, like fifty five forty five. Mm -hmm. That's just the way it are now. There's no, even though like Florida pulled off numerically one of the greatest upsets of all time. I don't really think it it was that massive because everybody's so close in the NHL now. I, I truly think that there's no more than like a 60% favorite in, in any single series. And I think the Vegas Edmonton series is probably, you know, I, I'd probably, I'd put Edmonton as a slight favorite, maybe like 53% to 47 or whatever. But uh, I, I always think when you get the, to this point, you know, Colorado was a different team last year because they were just loaded and, he was going to stop them but when in, in a fairly even series i'll always take the team that has like the better the better two players and nobody on vegas vegas has some great players but i don't think nobody matches dry saddle and mcdavid so that's that's a very unscientific way of saying why i think they're going to win but i have zero confidence in that or any other prediction and chris you were saying in one of our earlier conversations that it's been a compelling playoff so far because of its unpredictability well, there's like your James was just saying. There's so much parity now. Like Seattle, Seattle just uh, won last night against Dallas. You know, like their second year team, and they're like you said, Florida beating Boston. Florida was the President's Trophy winner last year. You know, so they were a pretty good team. So they 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 knew the pressure that Boston felt this year. So I always say that even in other sports too. There's but especially hockey. I think there's so much parity now that. Like you're saying, almost anybody can win. Like, and that's, I guess, that's the way they like it too. But uh, there's, there's no really any big favorites on with these last eight teams. I don't think. I you miss it. I do miss like the great teams. Uh, I, I like parity. I, I like the fact that any of these eight teams could win the cup, and it would be they'd all be pretty fantastic stories. But I, I do think you miss something when. Uh, when you don't have, like I said, those those great upsets, when you don't have dynasties, uh, 
and somebody pulls off you know what we grew up watching right I, I i do think in the cap era the fact that it's just different teams almost every year and that makes what tampa did get into three stuff three straight finals amazing um but i think it does lack a little something when uh when there is that much parody and you're not like you could take the eight teams that are left here and would any of them shock you seattle would be a hell of a story if they won the stanley cup but i wouldn't be shocked if carolina won the cup or if even you know new jersey went on a run mm-hmm. some none of it would if florida won the stanley cup i wouldn't be shocked i don't think any of us should be shocked because the teams are just all so even and you get a hot goalie and you go on a run and there you are and i and, and i tell you what i'm not shocked about is how well seattle's doing uh that is a ron francis built team it's dripping with experience for the lineup and james i thought if they if they could have made a save last year they might have been a much better first year team, let alone what we're seeing this year. Yeah, absolutely. I still am surprised though, uh, just because, you know, when Vegas had their expansion draft, it was so tilted in their favor and they made all those trades and they were just ready to to play right out of the bat. Whereas Seattle didn't, they made some odd picks in their expansion draft. And I think Ronnie was sort of taking the long-term view on this, but mm-hmm. the little signing, the free agent signings that they've made and uh, it is a real it's a real team, right? Like it's a superstar, uh, uh, less hockey team, but man, like get the guys like the, the Jade, the Jordan Everly's and such. And, uh, you know, a, a rookie like Matty Beneers, it just, it works together really well. And I'm kind of like, I like the, I'd like to see the Canadian teams just for the story and TSN kind of always roots for Canadian teams. Cause it's better for us, I think, but Seattle would be my, sort of favorite if I was looking at it from a just a pure fan standpoint because I love stories like that. And before we shift to the East, um, full disclosure, uh, Rick Bonus is a friend of mine, family friend. I was texting with him today. He's driving back from Winnipeg. Wanted to ask you about his post-game news conference. Um, that seemed to me have to have messaging that came from management on down. That wasn't just an off-the-cuff rant. Do you agree with that? Are there some systemic issues with the Winnipeg team, or what's your take on that? Oh, I definitely think there's systemic issues with the team. I think that's why Paul Maurice left. Uh, Paul Maurice won't say that. They'll say they needed a new voice. But I just think he looked at them and said, this isn't working, and they're not listening to me or whatever, and I'm getting out of here. And... I'm not sure about rehearsed from bonus because I'm not sure why you would do it in that circumstance. Fair, fair. Okay. I don't know what you accomplish for, from, from it, Paul, doing it that way. And I think Bones has always been really honest. And, you know, in that moment, his honesty, uh, like that, that's what it was. You, you, you rarely see that today because coaches are so polished and they usually, you know, choose their words carefully. I kind of liked it. And I like Bones, too. I got a history. He was the coach in Ottawa back when I was a reporter. Right. I had to show up on his driveway the day he got fired by the Senators. And I remember him with his kid out in the driveway. And I felt like crap as I pulled the camera out and, and interviewed him after he'd gotten fired. So I've always been a massive fan of Bones, too. Um, but I think a long-winded way of saying I think there's something definitely wrong with that core. And if they don't make some sort of significant changes, uh, they have issues. But it's tricky, right? That's It's tricky because guys don't want to be part of a rebuild. So if you get rid of, you know, a couple of guys, let's say you get rid of uh, Shifley and, you know, Pierre-Luc Dubois or whatever, then the other guys aren't going to want to stick around because now they're kind of in a rebuild. So it's it's going to be a really tricky summer for Shovel Day Off. Yeah, no, it'll be an interesting market to watch. Uh, in the East, uh, Toronto Maple Leafs, first off, I didn't like how they played in the first round for five of those six games, or at least four of those six games, but each game had a pivot point where it felt like the Leafs were going to win each game. It was a real interesting series. It's a long way of saying that they checked the box and punched their ticket to the second round for the first time since 2004, but I'm not sure we've seen their A game yet. Do you agree? Yeah, I think that's fair. They didn't, they had the one, game two yeah. was basically it. And, uh, you know, give Tampa credit and give Florida credit in game one of the series. I think Florida's a hard team to play against, and the Leafs found out that quickly. But 
I think the scary thing is if they do find their A game, they're going to be really tough to beat. And I think you saw signs in game one. I don't think that was a disaster whatsoever from the Leafs. No. I think both teams played pretty well in Florida. Just Toronto made some mistakes and Bobrovsky made some really great saves. But there were there were some shifts there from Toronto and a couple of the early power plays, even though they didn't score, where they were whipping the puck around. And you said, this is, you know, this is the Leafs at full throttle. And so I think you're right. If they can, uh, if they can do that in an extended period of time and Bob's calms down a little bit, because this is a little bit out of the blue from Bobrovsky, who really hasn't been this goalie in the last four years, what he's done the last couple of games against Boston and here. So I'm still not sure that that's a lot that he's going to run it like this through the playoffs. And if he breaks down a little bit, then I think it's going to be a great series. I think this is probably another six or seven game series, much like the Tampa one. Um, yeah. I think Toronto has the most talent left in the East, but that doesn't, again, with the predictions, I have no confidence they're going to win this round, let alone get out and go to the Stanley Cup final. Yeah. No, I just and I had this. Go, you yeah, sorry, go I just want to mention, uh, yep. yeah, that second period, Toronto played great. They, I think they were out, they, they tied up the game. They outshot them 12 to 5 at one point. And then that third goal with two minutes left by Florida, that was killer. killer. That was a killer because Toronto was going to go ahead three to two. And I, th I thought they were going to win the game. But that third goal by Florida, when they hadn't really been putting any pressure on Toronto for most of that second period. And then after that, it was kind of that was kind of the game, that that third goal by Florida. But I thought Toronto played pretty well for, I'd say, at least half the game. So, uh, like you said, it, I think it's going to be a really good series. I think. Uh, the key might be William Nylander. Like Matthews is playing well and, you know, Marner hasn't been perfect, but he's still racking up the points. And I thought he looked decent the other night. Nylander, if Nylander can get, you know, he, he has these, he'll go through a stage of like three or four games and he just looks untouchable. He looks like the best player on the ice on an ice with uh, Matt, with Matthews and Marner sometimes. And I think, Again, there's been signs of life, but he hasn't really had a game like that and has never really had a playoff like that. So um, he's the guy I'm looking for. And I, I'd like to see Ryan O'Reilly do a little bit more as well if they're going to if they're going to get out of this round and 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 go deep. Yeah, I, I agree 100 percent. And briefly to look into the future, I want to revisit Florida for a moment, but to briefly look into the future with the Maple Leafs, hypothetically, if they lose this round, all the pressure on that team and all the moves ha that Dubas has made, they can't, there's no way they can be happy with just a second round appearance. Do the pressure points return to that franchise? Like how does that look the next day? Yeah, I was having that exact same thought uh, the other night. I because there was such celebration when they, when they won the round and right away there was talk of extension for Dubas and Keith. And I think they'll both probably get them. I think it, that was enough for that. I think that was enough to probably bring back the core and not make huge changes again. But I don't think it's enough to declare it a successful season because I think it'll almost be more painful for Leaf fans because you now have that window in front of you. You'll never have a better chance. There's no juggernauts in front of you right now. Carolina's a good team. Jersey's a decent team. And Florida's a decent team. But there is a path right here. Uh, not only to the cup final, but perhaps to the Stanley Cup. And if they go out in five games or six games to the Florida Panthers, I think it'll hurt even more to an extent. But I, I think that, so I don't think, I don't think one round is a successful season, but I think one round does enough to maybe confirm that, uh, you know, Kyle Dubas's plan is okay and everything. I, I, I do think the pressure is off that way, but I think a loss especially like a quick loss would be just as painful as the first round loss to the fan base. Uh, quickly in the Florida Panthers, before we wrap up, I had this 25% inkling last night that they could go on a run going into that game. I felt for a moment, James, that they're going to have nothing left after the Boston series and they'll fizzle quickly. And the opposite uh, happened last night. Are you getting a creeping sensation that even though the Leafs are probably the favorites to win this game, this series that they may have a bit of magic going on here with Kachuk and the weather and the way they're playing, or am I overstating that? No, I think you, I think that's completely valid. And I don't know how you could watch that game and not think that mm -hmm. I think they've become, it's funny. I was in Florida 
earlier this year doing a piece on Luongo. So back in October when he was going into the Hall of Fame. So I spent some time with some of the executives there. And um, I don't think they thought their team was very good. I think that they thought they were going to miss the playoffs and weren't going to have a good season. So I think this even caught them a little bit by surprise. And look, they were dead with about a month left in the season, but Pittsburgh fell off and suddenly there was an opportunity and they got hot and the Lion and Nat played really great. And suddenly they were there. And uh, then I thought they were dead and gone down three, one to Boston. And suddenly there was life. And uh, I think that's the scariest team in the playoffs is, I don't, I don't believe in this idea that you have nothing to lose, like all the pressure is off because you get, everybody wants to win a Stanley Cup. So there's, there's pressure on everyone once mm-hmm. you're in this round they, to go all the way. It's not like Florida is playing. What's the, you know, they always stay like free money or whatever like this. That's not the case. They want to win, but you get a little mojo going, right? You're playing every second night and the little things like their four check is so efficient and the line rotation works and there's not any injuries and, suddenly everything starts to click and everybody figures out their role. And those are the most dangerous teams. Anaheim, I remember, was like that when they won the cup in, when they beat Ottawa in 07. That, uh, you know, obviously they had Pronger, Niedermeyer and uh, Getzlaff and everything. But if you guys remember, it was like the third and fourth lines that yeah. were really dominant in that series. And they just killed teams. They were just really physical and they were relentless on the forecheck. And that's kind of how they won the Stanley Cup. And Florida has a bit of that vibe to them. So, yeah, like I said, near the top of our discussion, the Leafs are, have more talent and should win the series. But if if Matthew Kachuk's holding up the Stanley Cup in a month and change, I wouldn't be shocked. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, I would say if I had to bet $10, and I'm not a betting man, <clears throat> I get a feeling not only is the Cup coming home to Canada this year, but I'll say it's Edmonton versus Toronto in the Cup final. Chris, you were having those same thoughts as well, weren't you? Yeah, yes, that, would be- that, that, that would be yeah ideal for you guys at TSN, and that, that would be awesome for, for everyone. What was would it be the last time? 89 Calgary and Montreal, maybe? The last time That's two right. Canadian teams in the Cup. Speaking of Montreal, I just... I just want to see, I, I see that Expos logo over your shoulder, Paul. And I think that's oh, one Paul. thing, or yeah, that's one thing the three of us have in common is yeah. in the, uh, in the seventies, when we were all little kids, we were all big Expos fans. I remember James, you mentioning how you at least you listened to it on the radio, the games, as did I, I know Paul's a huge Expos fan. James, did you mention, did you make it to a few uh, games at Olympic stadium back in the seventies, early eighties? Oh buddy, that was uh, despite what I said about football and hockey, my first passion as a sports fan was baseball. And it was because of the Expos and specifically Tim Raines, who uh, was my favorite athlete. And if, if you ask me my favorite athlete of all time, that it was Tim Raines. I was completely and utterly in love with the guy. Um, I would listen to the games in French back in the day because in, in uh, Ottawa, they didn't have an English contract. And I always tell the story that... Uh, I didn't know. I took, ended up taking French immersion, but in grades, you know, five, six, when I started listening to the Expos, I didn't know any French, and uh, I, al- I always thought there was a player on the Expos named Orling, because if you're listening to the French radio, yeah. it would be <laughs> and I'd be like, "Who's this Orling guy?" Uh, for the non-French people in your audience, uh, or de ling means foul ball, basically. Yeah. But I always yeah. thought. That guy named Orling that I didn't know about wow, flappy Orling. Um, so yeah. And then I would take the bus. There was a company in Ottawa called big man Chappie tours that went to the, uh, to the expos games every Saturday. And I spent most of the money I earned in whatever high school jobs I had and would go down every Saturday to, uh, to watch the expos. So I probably went 50 times. I was there for the first playoff game ever. Um, against the Phillies. And then the first game against the Dodgers, the year they made it. Uh, had my heart broken, sobbed in my basement when Rick Monday hit the home run. Blue Monday. And, whoa, you were you you were there for Jerry White's three run home run off of, yes, off of Jerry Royce. Oh, yes, that, that that's that's the high water mark for the franchise. I <clears throat> now we've taken the conversation to a wonderful place, James. I named my son <laughs> Dawson after Andre Dawson, so I was hardcore Expos fan. <clears throat> and Chris, whether you remember or not, uh, so game through the Expos and the NLCS in 1981, oh, they remember. split out west. Uh, Bill Gullickson won game two uh, under like underappreciated performance. He did very well. 
and they come back for game three. They're down one nothing to the Dodgers. They come back and tie it one one. Jerry White comes up and hits a three run home run with fifty seven thousand fans in the building, and it is the it's the high water mark for the franchise. Everything Rick Monday was two or three days later. I got those three days later. Gary Carter gets traded three years after that. Twenty years later, the team moves. The rest is history. So, but that was uh, to talk to someone who was in the building for that. That's that's the magical moment. It's just incredible. Yeah, um, one of yeah one of my great memories. And uh, uh, Jerry White was also the last out in the Rick Monday game. Remember that's there right. was a ninth, and I remember I wrote a my stupid parody started early because I I wrote a parody of I don't like Mondays, the Boomtown Rat song called I don't like Monday and I had full lyrics that I wrote about that about that game. <laughs> so uh yeah, it broke my heart and the truth is the year that uh the lockout the strike year the lockout year whatever it was when the season was canceled and they had a five game lead or whatever in the in the east that ended my love for baseball it, re- it really did I was devastated then um uh, and I th- I think that if I was to pinpoint a time that I I really stopped loving baseball. It was then, and then the Expos left a few years later, and that was it. And baseball fell off the map to me completely, to the point where, you know, if I had to host Sports Center Hollywood, I I would be exposed because I don't know baseball anymore. Uh, I don't know. I'll watch the Jays, you know, here and there, and I'll watch them if they get in the hunt in September. But I'm I was so bitter with baseball that, you know, I knew what I had to know to do Sports Center and Sports Desk as at TSN. But I never loved the game again the way it, the way I used to do back then. Well, and and just and not to prolong this too much, but you are basically reading off a teleprompter of my mind when you say this. Uh, I I grew up in my childhood studying the Brooklyn Dodgers, and I always said to myself, these people are capable of anything to move a franchise. To this, it's such a cynical side of sports business, and the Montreal Expos. Uh, 14 of their final 17 games in 1994, they drew more than 35,000 fans. They were on track to have a magical year, which would have propelled them forward to playoff success and solidifying the fan base. And instead, 10 years later, they moved away. Um, Heartbreaking, but always a good time to bring up the Expos and talk. So Chris Flynn, I'm grateful you brought up the Expos. I didn't know, James, I didn't know you're an Expos fan. That, that's that's just a wonderful turn of event in this podcast. So Chris, uh, final word to you before we wrap it up. I know you were excited for James to join us. Oh, geez. No, that's great. We, we could talk sports all night, I think, James. But I'm but, uh, just glad you, to have you on the show. We watch you all the time. Like I said, I enjoy your sense of humor that you add to, to the shows that you do. So just appreciate you uh, coming on with us tonight. Uh, buddy, my pleasure. And I, I meant what I said, man. You were you were an Ottawa legend um, long before I was into sports. And then and w- when you played uh, university ball, you, it was can't miss television the few times you were on, just scrambling around, scrambling your ass off. No real great arm, but just nobody could ever catch it and made things happen endlessly. And it was, I still think it's the most exciting university football maybe I've ever watched in Canada those three years when you were at your peak. So uh, I'm glad you're doing great. I'm glad you still chuck it once in a while. And uh, thanks both of you guys for having me on. Awesome. Really, really generous of you to take time for us. Um, very grateful for us. And maybe we'll invite you back someday when you have a bit more time in your hands. So this wraps up our edition of the Scramble podcast with Chris Flynn. I'm Paul Hollingsworth. We thank James Duffy for joining us and we shall see you next time.